My presentation today is called The CFL Sessions in Anonymous Authorship. Last summer I worked as an intern at the National Archives of Canada, where I was based as a song collector and as a folklorist. And where I also worked in the archives themselves. Uh, and I feel a bit weird having a camera here, and I used to perform in front of cameras, but the archives, uh, those of you maybe know people who work for them or with them, they insist on collecting everything that has anything to do with them with the archives, even performances, so they, they insisted that we uh, document this performance of, of these songs. Uh, anyways, when working at the archives in Ottawa, it was my job to go through the materials that they still had yet to uh, put into their system. My other job, my song collecting work, involved traveling throughout southwestern Ontario, where I sought out and recorded authentic Canadian folk music. I'll play for you today some of the work I connected in the Canadian fields uh, backwoods and city centers. But first I'm going to play for you a collection uh, that I discovered while working in the basement of the archives. A collection called the CFL Sessions. Thirdly, I'm going to put into context uh, the recent history of Canadian folklore uh, to which I've contributed. And I'm really excited about this conference and I want to thank those of you uh, who were involved in, in you know, coming up with the conference and executing it because a lot of uh, the presentations I've done on folklore and academic situations really like you don't often get to play the songs which is really what they were made for is playing and sharing you know at, at conferences you have to have to carve them up in one way or another uh, so thanks to everyone who's allowed performances at this this conference okay this the song collecting tradition goes back at least to cecil sharp francis james child and the more familiar because of their roles in rock history uh john and alan Lomax all of whom were committed to preserving pre-industrial songs and rituals. The Lomaxes set out on their first field recording expedition in 1933. It was on this trip that they recorded, among others, uh, the now famous blues musician Webdo, whom they discovered in a southern prison. The Lomaxes thought that prisons would be a good place to go to look for untainted uh, folk music. They saw prisons as a kind of uh, Tupperware container of the folk. Uh, places where the influences of mass culture uh, couldn't dilute the music's authenticity. Scott and R. Livingston, the late Canadian folklorist and song collector, whose work I'll share with you today, wasn't interested in prisons, uh, but he did similarly scour a particular institution in search of musical purity. Livingston scoured the Canadian Football League in the 1970s. He's left us very little written documentation, about which I'll talk a little uh, more a little later. And so it's uncertain why he thought the CFL uh, would be an airtight reservoir of folk culture. Um, perhaps it was the DIY nature of the league and some of the teams in their early history. It might have been the class position of many of the poorly paid players. Or perhaps it was the fact that Canadian football, constantly attempting to define itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis an American game whose rules rapidly changed uh, in the early 20th century, is itself a kind of folk preservation project. These can only remain hypotheses. Regardless as to Livingston's motivation, he's left us an impressive gift. Let's just see it that way. Yet it's a gift only recently opened. Although many histories of Canadian folklore discuss or allude to the sessions, their location has remained unknown until uh, quite recently. Livingston's sudden death in the late 70s and the fact that he lived a bohemian and transient lifestyle meant that his recorded works and writings were mostly scattered across Canada and the United States and parts of Europe at the time of his death. Until 2008, no one but Livingston himself and the community from which they came had heard these songs that I'm going to play for you today. But it is indeed the CFL sessions uh, that I myself discovered in the basement of the archives in 2008. The archives has boxes of materials dropped off to, off to them every day, just to give you a sense of like what actually happens there. Uh, and so we don't yet know exactly who fought to deposit the archives; they were just, you know, given to us basically. Um, and also, by the way, for future reference, anyone who's interested, there's an online archive that houses uh, recorded recreations of these songs, which I produced with the help of uh, Canadian and composer W. L. Altman. Uh, Indian musician, uh, Torontonian Laura Barrett, and uh, London's Pride and Joy, Andy McGoffin. And you can access that at the cflsessions.ca, which I'm just later. 
Now, I don't want to spend too much time on the mixing along the musicological or literary qualities of the songs themselves. Let's leave that for other conferences. Folk music itself is largely about non-instrumentalized, uh, communal, ritualistic, uh, what Livingston's mentor Harold Innes called time-biased uh, ways of knowing and being together. So my objective, at least in the first half of my presentation, is to simply play these songs as they would have been played. Uh, I'd like to discuss certain aspects of the songs and Livingston's method as they pertain uh, to the tunes, but I will do so uh, from here on in, off book, uh, as a way of paying uh, tribute to the original oral origins of the works. Uh, hopefully you'll permit me, though I do have a set list, uh, because I don't want to get lost. Um, okay. Yes. 